Hey gang, welcome to this week's episode of Bread's Food for Thought. We're now just about at the one week lifespan of version 3.0 for Splatoon 2, and the newly introduced Rank X. And I'm sure many of you have been able to dive in and may have found some games to be quite challenging with the higher caliber of play. I know I have, and it certainly hasn't always been easy. But what I've noticed is that Rank X really makes those who don't know how to be a team player stick out like a sore thumb. So I figured now would be a good time to go over a topic to help those of you maybe struggling in X rank, or those still looking to reach X. And that is with a term you hear float around quite a bit called coordination. And in particular, I hear about how good a team's special coordination might be. However, the base definition implies so much more than just special usage. So let's go ahead and define it as the ability to have different parts, or in Splatoon's case, players, work together smoothly and efficiently. There are so many different variables that go into team play. Some of the beats I want to hit on will of course be specials, but I also want to talk about sub-weapons, turfing, sharking, and flanking. And actually, let's go ahead and throw super jumping onto that list as well, and what I'll call the team's coordination machine. I'm sure a few others will pop into my head, and I'll be sure to highlight them if I do. But I'm making quite the to-do list for this week's episode, and I'm pretty sure this is going to be a long one, but I want to make sure I don't skimp on any details. So let's begin, shall we? I want to preface things with an explanation on the differences between solo Splatoon and team-based Splatoon. If you have never played Splatoon on a competitive team, then you might not know that there is a world of difference between solo play and team play. And understandably, that can be a hard door to open trying to make it onto a team, and for myself, I had a huge amount of luck being in the right place at the right time and talking to the right person. So you may be stuck as a solo warrior and only playing ranked mode in Splatoon, and thinking that's about all there is to the game, and you may even be pretty good at it. Maybe even watching a few tournaments and thinking it's the exact same as what you see in solo. However, the sad bitter truth is that that's just not true. I'm sure some of you may have been in a quote-unquote discussion with a quote-unquote competitive player, and they may have told you something along the lines of, oh well, that doesn't count because it wasn't in a tournament. And while there's usually a lack of understanding or careful consideration of words in those types of talks that negatively go south, the main point they're trying to make is that you can get away with almost anything in solo play at certain times that just wouldn't be allowed in organized play at higher levels. And that freedom that you have and are learning from in solo can teach you bad habits that you think are acceptable. A small example is in solo when you splat one person, you almost go back to being invisible as you eliminated the primary witness. However, in team play, as soon as you splat that one person, you have then been called out by that person to the remaining enemy team members, and reinforcements will probably be on the way to deal with you, essentially point censoring you, and your execution needs to be more on point in the following moments. That type of quality response just isn't present in solo, and you can be a bit more relaxed in what you want to do, essentially making your experience easier. I'll bring up more differences later, but for now let's truly get into the meat of our topic. So what did I mean earlier by a team's coordination machine? I think an easy way to visualize teamwork is as if it were a machine, and good teamwork is a well-oiled machine with timely maintenance to address any performance issues. A team's goal will come down to what they decide they want to accomplish, but speaking in a general manner, usually a team wants turf on the map, splats on the enemy, and control of the objective. I'm going to use a hypothetical team composition with roles included. Let's go with a blaster, a sloshing machine, a Tentatech Splattershot, and an NZAP85. And no, I have no idea what map and mode we're placing this comp on, so whether or not it's truly a good comp, I have no idea. But anyway, the main frontliner of this comp will be the Blaster. The Sloshine, or the Sloshing Machine, will be midline to back up the Blaster in case of any immediate needs of 2v1s, and so it isn't too far forward that it can't easily Stingray. The Tentatech will also be midline so it can support the Blaster on the front, but also so it can help out a little bit with the turfing as it's probably the second best in this particular comp, so the NZAP doesn't have to be the only main source of turfing output, even though that's what the main goal of the NZAP will be. Now with roles in mind, a team shouldn't let those purely dictate what you should and shouldn't be doing. Everyone on the team should be turfing, should be getting splats if the opportunity presents itself, and should be playing objective if the situation dictates it's your best opportunity to do so. Everything needs to be done in a very fine balance so that nothing should have to work harder than it needs to. Just as machines can be overworked and overheat, and suffer in performance, the roles of a Splatoon team can suffer a similar stress. A frontline slayer wants to be getting splats, but they shouldn't be so focused on that to the point where they're not even turfing at all, and always going in and possibly biting off more than they can chew, taking on too many enemies at once, 
or foolishly challenging enemies in better positions. If they go down too easily too often, a team can lose its most reliable source of offense, and may even just be playing down a member for the majority of the game. A person on turf control wants to be putting out high amounts of ink on the map, but that is a role that can be hard to do safely as you remain exposed and can be an easy target focusing on turf and not quite ready for a fight from the enemy's frontliners. If they go down, the entire team loses their main source of ink output, and sometimes the other weapons may not be able to do that very well. But they should not be sitting back so much and only turfing to the point where they're not supporting their teammates in any skirmishes. That is also a way in which a team can basically be playing down a member if someone is always too far back. So it's important for everyone on the team to be able to do everything to some degree. That way you can all help each other in whatever areas the team needs. Might be even sillier to imagine, but you can think of the team coordination machine like a four member Power Rangers Megazord. The main offense would be a dominant right arm, but if that arm gets blown off, it's good for the left arm to still be able to pack a punch. The right arm shouldn't always be swinging wildly and should be able to help block other appendages if they need cover. If both arms get blown off, it's good for the mostly supportive legs that help the team move around to still be able to kick. If the legs get blown off, it's great if the team can then be supported by the arms as the machine is skilled enough to walk on its hands. Again, kinda silly I know, but I hope you get the idea. Many hands make for light work, and if you're able to help each other out quickly, you can get that much more done sooner and together. I know you aggro players, pointing at myself, want to go out there as soon as possible and flat anything that moves, but just check on your turfer every now and then if they need any extra help, because if they're done with their job, they can then help you do your job sooner and better. It's a help them help you kind of deal, and that symbiotic relationship is the backbone of teamwork. And again, it's a lot easier to do when you can properly communicate, but it's not impossible to do in solo if everyone has a good sense of teamwork. Think about those games where you quote unquote carried your team and you look at that results screen and see that you have a number that may be way larger than anyone else on your team. You may have felt like you alone were the only one trying and getting anything done. But can you honestly say that you even tried to help your teammates accomplish anything while they were alive? You might be upset that you ended up losing map control, but did you even spend any time turfing the map yourself? Looking at Splatnet is a great way to know how much you turfed. I think a good average to strive for in a decent land game is 1000 points regardless of the weapon. Getting revenge kills is great and all, but that isn't the exact same thing as helping them get an actual 2v1. That's just a 1v1 that your teammate lost, and another 1v1 that you were able to win and get a benefit of a plus 1 to your KA score at the end. Sometimes there are games where some people just aren't able to fend for themselves, and you aren't able to help them stay alive no matter how hard you try. Skill gaps are a very real thing, and they might just lack the experience, but hopefully they're able to learn from what they might be doing wrong and improve. But I think the amount of conscious teamwork applied to a lot of these games where someone hard carries might be surprisingly low. In some games people feel they didn't deserve to lose is actually properly fitting because you were on a team that you didn't try to help and only helped yourself, and the team with the better teamwork will always deserve to win. Specials can have a huge impact when playing Splatoon, but that comes with a big provisionary IF they are utilized well. It's very much a case of, with great power comes great responsibility. The best use of specials is in a coordinated effort to either push with the objective, maintain an advantageous control of the objective, or reclaim the objective, as playing around the objective is obviously the way you'll win the game. There's no doubt most specials are powerful enough to help you more easily splat your opponents, but it's so easy for people to, more or less, waste their special just trying to splat one or maybe two people that they don't really gain much from. Now, as there are always exceptional situations, it's imperative that you make sure you're prioritizing whether your engagement with someone really deems the necessity of using your special. Just think about whether or not this is the person you need to splat in order to further the objective. Now, I will say Splat Zones is a bit more loose with this, provided you already have control of the zones. At that point, your goal is to prevent anyone from coming back to the zone. But regardless of mode, you pretty much always need to take into account your proximity of the objective with your special. Questions you should be asking yourself should be, am I defending objective? Will I gain points from this? Will I maintain points from this? Am I defending the survival of my team? Am I defending myself? Could my main weapon or even sub-weapon be a better choice? Should I be fighting here? Did I overextend looking for trouble? Stuff like that. So let's take a look at this scenario. It's Splat Zones on Blackbelly Skate Park, and the enemy team just got control of the zones. But they're losing a lot of members, and their forge is pushed way up on our side of the map. 
And while I do applaud the attempt to keep their enemy at bay, and I'll even further praise the fact that they're not playing defense from behind the zones, but they're very much not taking into account the status of the rest of their team. There's very few members alive on their side, and the Forge is so far in enemy territory that they're in a dangerous position putting another life at risk on their team that already has a lack of field presence. Now finding themselves in a 1v2, they very much feel the pressure of being outnumbered, and in order to try to resolve that deficit, they elect to use their Bubble Blower special. My first problem with this is that initially, they were spacing me decently to where I was having slight trouble closing the gap between us, and taking bits of damage along the way because they kept shooting their gun. But they chose to stop that, and instead use bubbles in such a way that not only doesn't agree with the terrain of their position, but they also gave me a free 4 seconds to set up, as that's how long it took them to set up, and all because they had their special ready and felt like they had to use it to survive, even though they chose to stay in this situation. The better option would have been to slowly back up and keep shooting, and maintain spacing as well as throw a suction bomb which would force me out of my cover and try to find new cover, or possibly recklessly approach them in a weakened state. And let's go even deeper. Let's say they won against the odds and splatted both me and my squiffer. That then only makes it a 2v2 where they don't have good control of the middle of the map, and they now have to beat two more people, and this time without bubble blower at all. They would have to try and reclaim objective in a weaker map position without one of their strongest options available. I mean, I guess at the very least they would have an oh so precious medal of honor of winning a previous 2v1 on their resume. Splats are always cool to look at after all, right? Overall, this was just not an engagement that person needed to be a part of, as they had very little to gain, and their team especially did not need them to be doing this, which again means they should have just backed up and headed back to regroup with their team, with a special intact. Now understandably, there is a very real heat of the moment pressure that is easy to be caught up in, and when you have your shiny special already with your glowing squid looking fresh, it can be hard not to do what is referred to as a panic special. But maintaining your composure and asking yourself those questions I mentioned previously may help, as long as you're putting forth careful consideration. Using specials together makes for an even stronger force to be reckoned with, and ideally your opponents are all splatted, but at the very least forced to back off and then trapped in a disadvantageous position. In solo, it can be a bit hard to try and compound your team specials together because lack of communication can be a massive hurdle. And if people are being unsafe and not living long enough to reach their special, or selfishly using it for their own benefit, it can be difficult to get that progress that the entire team needs. It's important to be able to develop that team mindset of we, us, and our, as opposed to I, me, and my. Teamwork is a very simple concept that is even easier to mess up, because we get in our own ways and prioritize little things we want to do over what the team needs. I'll go ahead and donate my well-being to Squid Research and demonstrate how much stronger coordination is than solo specials. Here we have a nice little 1v1 going on, and you see me use my rain to pressure a small area that wasn't really relevant, and my current opponent also wastes their special on me, and neither one was very effective. So now I'm down an ink storm that I can no longer put towards zone preservation and waste it on one person that I didn't even get, when I could have at least used it on two and or a more populated area. And all of a sudden, oh look, a splashdown. Crap, better move out of the way. Well, that wasn't so bad. Oh crap, it's followed up by a bomb rush. And double crap, I'm targeted by missiles. And there's a roller pushing up covered by the area gained from the specials. And if you look even closer, you might even see a stingray that would even further obliterate any of my already weakened remains, and to top it off, they secured the zone. That's a pretty effective display of teamwork from the opposing team that we couldn't do much to stop. Here my team just coordinated all four of our specials to get control of the zone and push the enemy back, and I was very surprised to see that they were able to recover, and in turn, did the same to us. It was pretty shocking to see consistent displays of teamwork everywhere. They first use Ink Storm, and by itself, it would certainly be no big deal, but it's reinforced by Bubbles, and there's a Baller on the loose. And the Brush also uses their Splashdown, partially on the zone to contribute to objective, but also partially on our side of the map, so we can't have anyone in that area. So you can see the amount of safe places for me to be quickly disappeared, and there's not really much I could do about it, as I was already caught up in it. I was the only one who immediately got splatted, but the rest of my team was pushed back and could no longer defend very well, and my end zap gets splatted later, so it was still a pretty effective amount of teamwork that got two of us down and the enemy controlled the zone. This example, we have less than 30 seconds left, and we gotta push the tower past 43. So, no better time for teamwork. I push past the tower very slightly to attack someone approaching. And while I could push up even further, my team doesn't really need that, as we need to make sure the tower is for sure able to move forward making that Clash Blaster attacking my Splatling the immediate priority, 
and as my Heavy decided to use Bubbles, it's a good defense for the tower, that's not exactly the best move for their own safety, since they did it a bit too late since the Clash Blaster was already in their face. But like any good State Farm teammate, I'm there to help defend them. If I wasn't there to help support my Splatling, this push would have been over, and I would have been pushed up a bit further than I needed to be, and probably thinking something like, oh my gosh, what is my team doing? Just push the tower. When it very much would have been on me for not being where my team needed me to be. But now with the entire team down, we can for sure move up our line of defense around the tower. And I don't even have to go alone, as my buddy Mark is also there to help. And I finally have my bomb rush, which I'm able to use to help us continue our push, and the enemy has to respect the bombs, and they can't fully approach freely. And our well-executed teamwork rewards us with a win. Platoon usually favors the quality push over the quantity push. And since you don't always have access to your special, it's probably to your team's benefit to make sure you have the objective moving forward if you have specials going off, so that will probably be your best opportunity to do so. To go along with that, it's important to keep in mind if you have people available to take advantage of your special. I hate seeing emphasis on a Stingray in Splat Zones, especially towards the end of the game if most of the team is down and the enemy has control of the zone. Even if an expert quad was achieved with the Stingray, if there's no one to paint the zone, how does that help you not lose if there's no time left? We really seem to like the gamification data that Splatoon tells us, such as how many splats you get on the results screen, or how high your league power is, or the new X rank power, or top player position, stuff like that. And while sometimes it's a distraction from actual gameplay, it still provides a decent focus on some tangible achievements to strive for. A fun thing to encourage teamwork would be a true special combo that the game actually acknowledged. Sure, an Inkstorm is neat, and Stingray is a pretty good special, but Stingrain? Now that is a true combo. Stingjet aimed at the enemy's spawn? OP. Bubble Ray? Yeah, good luck stopping a Rainmaker push while that is going on. These are the types of combos teams should be striving for, and if the game actually told us that we're playing some next level Splatoon, I bet lots of people would be trying all sorts of combinations more often. And it would be the norm to try and pull off your flashy finish of a Big Bang Kamehameha times 2 What? You've never seen that move in Splatoon before? Well, let me show you what me and my team were able to achieve. And these types of combination moves don't have to be exclusive to specials. Sub-weapons can also have some true combos, such as a toxic bomb. A splat bomb thrown at someone trapped in a mist? Super effective. And the options just get even more overwhelming when you start thinking about sub and special combinations. If you liked toxic bomb, try toxic bomb rush. Super duper effective. Did you barely survive that stingray and now you're super weak? Well, I've got bad news for you, because there are burst bombs heading your way. AKA, the insult to injure ray. I'll stop after that last one. But I encourage teams to explore what types of combos you want to set up with using the entire kits you have at your disposal, as they can be some easy ways to organize teamwork. Now I want to talk about two terms, sharking and flanking, and how they relate to coordination. When you're stalking your opponents and lying in wait for them, that's usually referred to as sharking. Almost as if you're a shark in the water circling a target with your dorsal fin sticking out. While it's a good tactic every now and then, since it doesn't do much to reveal your location to the enemy, making them easy to surprise attack, it typically means that you yourself are not doing anything in the meantime. So you're not providing much turf for your team, and actively losing turf if the enemy is being more proactive in that department. And it's even more unfortunate when you shark for long periods of time, only to get hit with stray bullets and get splatted anyway, or just fail to execute your attack which is equivalent to you just being stuck on an extended amount of time respawning, making your entire team play down a member for that much longer and nothing to show for it. So it's important to keep in mind the shifting tides of battle, if your team can afford to have you doing next to nothing, just waiting and sharking. As for flanking, that is a term used to describe an attack from the side or some direction that isn't considered the main head-on direction. A good flank can also make for a good strategy, as it ideally provides an easier offense to an enemy position that will help the rest of your team gain more ground overall. However, flanking is a very time-sensitive and skill-sensitive thing. You have to be good enough to execute your flank, but you also can't take too long to flank. Usually this will result in some sort of division of your team and weaken the overall strength of your forces. 
If you want to push a Rainmaker, it can be good to have someone flank to try and create an opening, but that leaves the Rainmaker more vulnerable, and if the flanker messes up their execution, it would have been better for them to be with the rest of the team and reinforce the defense of the objective. And if the flanker takes too long, the main force may be overwhelmed and wiped out making the flank for nothing. However, if the objective is stuck and can't break through any further, flanking the enemy could be just the thing you need to weaken the enemy defense and push the objective further. It can be a tough decision to know what the right choice is, but one that can have a high risk, high reward. Either way, it's important to have enough conviction to confidently stand by and follow through whatever decision you make. It's equally important to keep in mind if it's a good time to flank or if you have the time to flank depending on the distance that needs to be traversed. For super jumping, I feel like that may be one of the most telling aspects of a person's experience, or at least awareness. I'm sure you've met that person who will always jump in, no matter what, even though they should be able to take a quick second and realize how successful of an action that might be. If it's deep on the enemy side of the map, and they have all four members up, probably not a good idea, especially if you notice that their color ink is appearing around the person you're looking to jump to. If the entire enemy team is down, you can pretty much jump wherever you like, as you have the time to do so safely. Clearly bad jumps are something that are so easy to avoid. If you just respawn and swim there, you may even be able to turf a little bit along the way and give your team more map, and yourself more meteor turrets for special. But if you jump poorly and get splatted, that's just even more time you spend not participating, and leaving your team down another person longer than needed. It can turn an unfortunate single into a completely unnecessary double for the enemy team, and all the science for whether or not it's a good idea are staring you right in the face as you can see the whole map and you can see how many enemies are active. That being said, jumping is a good way to be able to keep your team coordination machine running and replace any missing parts quickly. If your team is on the offensive and you lose two people and one of the remaining people is able to get the others back in action quickly, the enemy has to deal with a fully reinvigorated enemy that much sooner than if the people respawning had to travel all the way across the map where the opportunity to stay on the offense may have slipped away. Super jumping is a great option that gets poorly executed far too often for silly reasons. Just super jump with care, or you may be causing more harm to your team than is necessary. Whew, we made it. It was a long journey, but we made it through together. And hopefully I've helped you learn something that will help you improve on your teamwork. You Want to keep your team coordination machine running smoothly, like clockwork. You're welcome, Hitzel. Assess the urgency of using your special. You don't want to make a figuratively and literally pointless play. And being able to combine it with other people will always have a larger impact. Never shark too often or too long unless you have a comfy lead and can afford to be a bit inactive. And try to make your flanks quick if you're going to do them, but also make them count. But as those are very single base maneuvers, only do them if you think they will benefit the team. And take a quick snapshot of the map if you're going to super jump and keep in mind how many enemies are up and how soon they might be respawning. Not having to have your team pick up your slack or clean up after you is an aspect of teamwork as well. Mitigate your mistakes and risky plays so no one has to work harder than is needed. A few announcements before I go. This past weekend was the top 8 for the 2018 US Canada Inkling Open, and there's lots of great matches that display teamwork and the commentators even mentioned some of the same concepts I talked about in this video, so I highly recommend watching that sometime if you didn't. And I just want to give a big thank you to all of you who seem to be enjoying this experimental series of mine way more than I ever imagined, and I really appreciate all of your kind words and support. I also want to give a shout out to fellow Splatoon content creator Spectre, as she has her own various educational series, but one in particular that I enjoy called Inside the Spectacle, and she goes over concepts in a similar manner. So if you like my stuff, I highly recommend you go check out her channel as well. We even both happen to have our second episodes on positioning, but she provides additional insight on the matter. Lastly, Ink TV Splat is going to be having an Ink Radio podcast over on their Twitch channel tonight. And those are always a good listen to learn about people and discussion of various topics in the community. I'll include links for everything down below. But now I've kept you more than long enough, so that's it for my wrap up. This has been the Gingerbread Man, and you can catch me next time. Thanks for watching. No one can defeat the quad laser. It is over now. The bullet is enormous. There is no escaping. Jumping is useless. Oh, God, my back!